This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and healthful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. vsh.org. I'd like to welcome you all to the monthly meeting, the monthly public lecture sponsored by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii. Thank you very much for coming. The Vegetarian Society of Hawaii is a not-for-profit volunteer organization founded in 1990 for the purpose of supporting the environment, promoting human health, and promoting animal rights by means of vegetarian education. It's one of the largest local vegetarian societies in North America, now with over 1,800 members. Is anyone here for the first time? Could you raise your hand? Okay, that's great. How many are members of the organization? Not so many, and that's good too. Not that we don't like to see our members, but it's always good to have new friends. I'd like to encourage everyone who is not a member to become a member of the Vegetarian Society either tonight, we have our membership flyers over on the literature table, or you can take one home, fill it out, and send it in. There are many benefits of membership in the Vegetarian Society. Now it's time for tonight's special speaker. We're delighted to have with us Dr. Neil Pinckney. Dr. Pinckney has a remarkable story to tell us about his firsthand experience with heart disease. He'll discuss means of preventing and reversing the devastating effects of heart disease, diabetes, and high blood pressure while losing weight in the process. Dr. Pinckney is a graduate of the University of Southern California and Oxford University, where he received his PhD in clinical and educational psychology. He has completed postdoctoral work at Stanford University and at the University of Vienna. He's Professor Emeritus and former Chair of Behavioral Sciences at California State University, Sacramento, and he has taught at the University of California Davis Medical School. He also had a private practice in family and individual therapy and psychoanalysis for nearly 30 years. In Hawaii, he's founder and director of the Healing Heart Foundation. Please welcome Dr. Neil Pinckney. Aloha kako. Hi, everybody. I start every talk with the same. Is that, can you hear me okay? I, I want to get it just about the right distance. I start every talk with the same comment. My name is Neil Pinckney, and I'm not supposed to be here tonight. <laughs> Why am I not supposed to be here tonight? Because 12 years ago, I went in to get an angiogram because I had... What happened was I was crossing the street at the Varsity Theater on University to run to get a snack while I was waiting in line to get in the theater. And while, while I was crossing the street, an elephant stepped on my chest. At least that's what it felt like. And I went in and got a treadmill and then got an angiogram. And when I got the angiogram, they came back and told me that I had one foot in the grave and one foot on a banana peel that if I didn't, get an, I didn't get a bypass surgery the next morning, I would be dead in a week or so. Well, I didn't have the bypass surgery because I told them it was against my religion. And well, what's your religion? I'm a devout coward. <laughs> and, and I still am. I, I, I adhere to that religion faithfully. In any case, I'm here tonight because 12 years ago, when I decided not to have the surgery, but to follow a lifestyle change, which included a vegetarian, low-fat diet, exercise, and stress management, I needed to get help, and I needed to find out what a vegetarian diet was, and how to eat it, and what, what could I eat, and where could I get it. 
And so I came to a meeting just like this of the then called Vegetarian Society of Honolulu. Now, we're very grander, we're the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii. And I came to this group and along the way were all kinds of pamphlets of information and a lot of helpful people. In fact, I could say that along with the lifestyle changes, the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii saved my life. And I'm very grateful to this group of very, very helpful people. Uh, when you have a question, if you see one of the members with the little, I think they're the green name tags, aren't they, Alita? The, the members and board members and volunteers, they really do help give you information. At least they did help me. And the president at that time was Ruth Heydrich, and she became my fitness coach and inspired me uh, to get in better shape. I lost 40 pounds, went from 38 to 32 in my waistline, and felt a whole lot better. Now, I'll give you an example of how this kind of lifestyle change can really make a difference. I couldn't walk from here to that door without having to sit down. I had such terrible pain. Seven months after I joined the Vegetarian Society and started on this lifestyle, I finished in the middle of the pack of the Great Aloha Run. Now that is, is an amazing difference when you think about it. Well, what I want to talk about tonight are a couple of things. It's wonderful to be a senior. It, I, it, I didn't think I would enjoy it so much, but now I have an excuse for forgetting everything. It's great. Now, let me ask, how many people here have high cholesterol? A lot of you. How many people don't know what your cholesterol is? You find out. It's a really good thing to know, and it can help save your life if you do something about it. How many people here have high blood pressure? How many people here have diabetes? How many people here want to lose some weight? Would like to lose some weight? Okay, you can do all of those things. That is, you can reverse heart disease, you can lower cholesterol, you can lower blood pressure, you can... I've had people in my support groups, and I'll tell you about them in a minute, but I, I do 10-week support groups. And if you're interested in any of those aspects, on the 23rd of this month, I'm starting a new support group at Kaiser Honolulu Clinic on Pensacola. It's free. It's on the 23rd, will be the first meeting at 6 o'clock, and come over there. You have to call Kaiser Honolulu Clinic to their lifestyle and health and wellness group and make a reservation. You just can't come without having made a reservation at Kaiser. But I'll be starting a group, and I'm going to tell you that I've had people on 120 units of insulin 10 weeks later being off medication for diabetes. That's how amazing lifestyle changes can be. Well, here's what I want to ask you a question. I read an article very recently, and it quoted a Dr. Edward Miller, who is uh, the CEO of Johns Hopkins University Hospital, and their chief of one of their lifestyle organizations, and also the chief of their heart clinic. And Miller said that they did a study at Johns Hopkins with people who had bypass surgery. Now they had serious heart disease, and it was so serious that they felt that they needed to have their arteries opened up by having bypasses, detours put around them, veins taken out of their legs, veins taken from their other parts of their chest cavity, and, and, and just, you know, crack your ribs open, Rip open your chest, take your heart offline, do the surgery, and then try to start your heart up again with a chance of about 15% chance of having serious cognitive deficits after that surgery. And these are the people who suffered that when they found out, when they did a study to find out how many people made any kind of changes 
to avoid having further surgery or heart attacks or hospitalization, they found out that nine out of ten did nothing. They, made, they did not make the changes. Now, why was that? Well, some of it was probably because some of those people weren't told what changes to make. I mean, there are some physicians who just don't give all the alternatives to people or inform them fully. But I don't think that's the main reason. I think the main reason is that they weren't told if they weren't told. It's simply because every physician I've talked to said, well, I tried. I've given the people the information, but they don't stay on the program. They don't stay with it. They don't make the changes. So I have to give them medication and I have to give them other things in order to keep them alive because they won't make the changes. Well, I want to ask you tonight, why don't people make changes to save their lives? I mean, if they, all the people here who have high cholesterol, have you actually done all the things necessary without taking, without medication to lower your cholesterol? Do you know what all the things are that you could be doing? That's another good question. Maybe you don't know what they are, but that's easy to find out. In fact, if you want to find out what you can do, if you write this down, www.kumu, K-U-M-U, dot O-R-G, www.kumu.org. And that's a website, the Healing Heart Foundation website, and on it there are there is a full website with my book, the Healthy Heart Handbook, online for free. You don't have to buy it, although you can get it at the library. Every branch of the Hawaii Public Library has a copy or two, so you don't have to go out and buy it. I'm not, isn't that nice? I'm, you got a speaker coming to you tonight that isn't trying to sell his book over there. I don't, I, I don't like selling books, but they're available on the website as well, uh, although you can buy them at Amazon a whole lot cheaper because they have used ones on Amazon for two or three dollars. So, so if you want the book, go to Amazon. Anyway, if, if you go there, you'll find out what it is you need to do and how to do it. But I'll go over that a little bit tonight. But I wanted to, I, I started looking as a psychologist, I started looking, well, why don't people make these changes? I mean, I was told I was going to die if I didn't have a bypass, and I didn't have the bypass, and I went and made the changes. And as a vegetarian, you can't go whole hog, you have to go cold carrot. Uh, can't do anything with hog as a vegetarian. So I did, when I, when I found out, I followed the plan of Dr. Dean Ornish, and I'll tell you a little bit more about him in a minute. Dr. Ornish talks about changing your diet, adding regular aerobic exercise, and stress management. But in his diet at that time, he no longer does, but in his diet at that time, he allowed one serving of any food that had egg whites, not egg yolks, but egg whites, and non-fat dairy, one serving a day. He no longer recommends that anymore, but he did at the time, 12 years ago. Well, Dr. John McDougall, some of you know from, from being here in Kalilua or, or from his national books, Dr. McDougall said, why not just dump all the eggs and the dairy and, and go all the way vegan and no animal products? So I just did that. I figured it's not going to be that much more to drop the eggs and the non-fat dairy. So I went completely vegan. And I found out that an amazing thing that Dr. McDougall later told me was very common. I used to wake up with my nose full and blew my, blow my nose and fill a half a dozen Kleenexes every morning. After I dropped the egg whites and the dairy, that stopped. It was amazing. I, I had 60 years of allergy and all of a sudden, no allergy anymore. It was the dairy and it was either the dairy or the egg whites or both, or, or, or the combination. So. I want to say, well, why is it that people don't make the changes? And I have some, I, I did some little research and I did a little bit of, of thinking about it. And I came up that there are some very common misconceptions about why people don't make changes and why they think changes are hard. And, 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 those, and they really are misconceptions. They're, they're, okay, the first one is 
that personal crises are necessary to make changes. Well, if that were so, wouldn't you think those 700 people who had the bypass and didn't, and, 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 and 630 of them didn't make any changes, you'd think that 700 people looking at death or open heart surgery again would think, you'd think they, that's a big enough crisis to make changes, but they didn't make the changes. So it isn't the personal crisis that causes you to make the changes, it's what you do about the personal crisis, not, not the crisis itself. The second thing was, knowing the facts will give you, will, if people know the facts, they'll make the changes. Want to bet? If people know facts and make changes, how come there are still smokers left? Think about that. If, every, if, if people knew the facts and made the changes, there wouldn't be a single cigarette left in the United States. So that's one of the things that is, is really a misconception. In fact, research has shown that appeals to emotion work much better than factual information for people to make major changes in their life. The third misconception is that fear is a mo major motivator. Well, I guess to some extent I, was, I had fear of dying. I think maybe that would help me motivate me. But I don't think fear is the best motivator. I think instead of worrying about dying, looking at a positive future is much more effective. And, and I can show you how Dr. Dean Ornish actually made a difference that way as well. The fourth one is that people have their mindset. They're, they're, they've built up habits over a lifetime they can't change. It, it's too hard to change because their mindset. If you think about this, when people have accidents and lose the function of part of their brain, it doesn't take very long for most people, if the damage wasn't so severe, for other parts of the brain to take over those functions. People learn how to do things a new way. People who lost the use uh, or, or the ability to move certain parts of their body are able to use other parts of the brain for speech, for, move, for motion, for, for, for all the sensory experiences. And so, not everybody does it all the time, but, but we know that people can make change. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how habit-ridden you are. You can make changes, and, and there's no reason that age doesn't keep you from making changes, nor does, does experience keep you from making changes. And the last one is the most interesting of all. People say, well, great big changes are much harder to make than little changes. So just start off doing a little bit. Like, instead of becoming vegetarian, just give up beef. But you can eat chicken and fish and pork and lamb, and but it doesn't turn out to be true. The bigger changes are actually easier to make than little changes. And, and research has definitely shown this, that the, the more drastic the change is, the more people are likely to succeed in that change because little changes don't give the rewards. If I had made little changes after they told me I was going to die if I didn't have a bypass, and I just didn't lower my fat very much, and I didn't, and I started eating maybe just chicken instead of chicken and beef, which has about the same amount of cholesterol as, you know, chicken and beef anyway, and I still had the pain, and I still couldn't get across there without having to sit down on the floor because the pain was so severe, those changes wouldn't have been rewarded, and I would have given up on them probably. But having made the major changes, I had the major benefits, and the major benefits motivated me to continue to do that. So here's the question then. If, if, if these are common misconceptions, how come Dean Ornish, 25 years ago, took a large group of people with serious heart disease, and instead of giving them bypass surgery, gave them a low-fat vegetarian diet, regular aerobic exercise and stress management and support groups and 77% of those people were still on the program two years later 
Over 70 were on the program 10 years later, and a large proportion of them who are still alive, who haven't just, you know, got in their 90s and, and eventually just died of old age, there are, uh, I met a number of people who started on that program 25 years ago and are still on the program and are healthy and are volunteering now to come in to his program to help other people who are new to the program and tell them about their experience. I had the very good fortune of meeting Dr. Ornish and he heard about my support groups here in Hawaii and asked me to join his organization and I started doing support groups with him, the weekly, the one week residential retreats in California with him. And so I've gotten to very, very lucky because his pioneering research is basically what made me not have the bypass and, and go ahead and, and uh, do this. So if that's the case, how come these 77 people, percent of the people two years later, over 70 percent five and ten years later, and a very high proportion of the people, even 25 years later, are still on the program. I've been on it 12 years, and I've never felt better physically than, than I feel today. When I, I don't, you know, I think, well, gee, wish, I wish I was 40 years old again. No, I don't. I was not very healthy when I was 40, but I'm really, I can do things now I couldn't possibly do when I was 40. So those are the things, okay, what are, what is the program? What is it that you would be doing if you were to follow a heart reversal or a heart prevention program? And by the way, there's a significant difference in one aspect between reversal and prevention. On a reversal program, that is people already have high cholesterol, high risk factors, heart disease, they, they know they have some blockages, those people limit their fat to 10% of the calories they eat. Well, you know, how do you do that? We don't count calories. You don't worry about, you know, calculators and things like that. If you buy something that has a nutrition facts label for every 100 calories, you just don't want more than one gram of fat. It will have the number of grams of fat and the number of calories. Just avoid anything that has more than one gram of fat per 100 calories. Actually, that gives you uh, about 9% calories from fat, but the manufacturers round off numbers, so you may be getting 10 or 11, but you're right down there at 10% that way. If you're, just re if you're just trying to prevent heart disease and you don't have any heart disease or any of the risk factors at the moment, 20% fat is what Ornish recommends, and he has shown that people who stay on the 20% fat usually never wind up developing blocked arteries or heart disease. So there's a significant difference. If you're reversing it, 10% of calories from fat. If you're just trying to prevent it, 20%. If you looked at the paper this week, you saw, did you see the article about the WELL diet, the W-E-L-L -L diet, the research in Australia, that this new WELL diet, which has meat and dairy and fat, and it's now, and they claim it did much better than a low-fat diet. Well, it didn't do better than a low-fat diet. It did better than a slightly less fat diet than people had been eating. In Australia, I'm not sure what the, what the average calories from fat is, but I think it's higher than the United States because they eat more dairy than we do. We average about 43% of all our calories from fat here in the United States, 42, 43%, about four times more than we really need. Australians probably do a little more. It, when they compared the new well diet, W-E-L-L -L diet, they compared it to a 30% fat diet. Well, 30% just doesn't do it. It doesn't reverse it, it doesn't prevent it. People who have heart disease who go to a 30% diet, fat diet, get more heart disease. It gets worse. If they go to a 10% fat diet, the heart disease reverses. I don't have the blocked arteries that I had 12 years ago because it, my body has actually removed the blockages from my heart. Okay, what's vegetarian? Vegetarian is very clear. You hear a lot of things about the benefits of fish. Well, you can get the omega oils from 
plant-based foods. You don't have to get fish to get omega-3s and other essential oils. There's absolutely nothing that a pure vegetarian, a vegan, needs except for possibly a supplement of vitamin B12. And those are very inexpensive, easy supplements to take and just not a problem. Everything else, everything else on a well-balanced vegetarian diet is all that anybody needs. And there, there's enough research now to be able to show that that's all we need. But if you just change your diet and you're taking in more calories than you're burning, you're not going to lose weight. You, you're not going to do a lot about lowering your cholesterol because your fat is actually building up. You're putting fat in your body, and that fat is in your bloodstream. If anybody's seen Dr. Michael Clapper's video, A Diet for All Reasons, he has a place where he had, he's, he was an anesthesiologist in a place where he drew blood for, for surgery the next day, and he looked at the blood, and there was a test tube, and about half of the test tube was this thick yellow sludge in the test tube. And he went down and asked the patient what he'd done. And he said, well, he'd been to McDonald's and had a Big Mac and a chocolate shake and, and uh, french fries. And what it was is that yellow stuff that was making up half the volume of the sample of blood that took out of his arm was fat floating in the blood. And that fat was adhering to artery walls and causing the artery walls to get irritated to build up a, a situation which eventually causes plaque to adhere and blocks the artery. So exercise is a very important aspect of doing things as well as uh, you have to do something to burn more calories or at least the same number of calories. If you want to lose weight, the magic bullet, just burn more calories than you take in. That's the whole secret of losing weight. There is no diet that you can be given, South Beach, Atkins, any of the others, that's going to cause you to continue to lose weight and keep it off over a long period of time. Initially, you may lose some weight, but the research is very clear. You don't keep it off, and you wind up sometimes gaining back more than you had when you started the diet, which is not any fun. I don't know how many people here have tried it, but even if you aren't going to become a vegetarian, just start lowering the number of calories you take. And the best way to lower calories is to lower fat. You know, there's more fat in one McDonald's french fry, one piece, than there is in a whole baked potato. Think about that. How many pieces do you eat? You order, supersize me, order a large order of fries, if you compare that large order to McDonald's 30 or 40 years ago, it's like five times bigger than what it used to be. You're eating probably about the equivalent of fat of eating about 40 baked potatoes. I don't know how many people would sit down. And, and the sugar. How many people here have a soft drink, like a Coke or a Pepsi or a Mountain Dew every day or close to every day? 11 teaspoons of sugar in one can of Coke or one Pepsi or one root beer or one ginger ale even. Eleven teaspoons. If you saw me sitting down at the restaurant next to you with a cup of coffee and I took eleven spoons of sugar and put it in my cup of coffee, you'd shake your head. Say, there's something wrong with this guy. It's like putting ketchup on apple pie. You know, it's just crazy. But you drink a Coke and you're drinking 11 teaspoons of sugar. Not that, 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 that it, you know, if you burn it off, other than, you know, maybe giving yourself a few cavities here and there, if you burn it off, it's not going to be that terrible that if you have that, but if, it's not good for you for refined foods anyway. So we'll go on to the next thing. Stress management. Ornish has three aspects of his program. And stress management is basically, you can't avoid stress. Stress is everywhere. And it, if you're working, there's stress for people who 
you work for, because of the people you work for or the people who work for you, you're going to wind up with stress. If you're in a family situation, if you got kids, kids, the way to spell kids is S-T-R-E-S-S. -S. Uh, you know, you know, insanity, you know, is in, 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 insanity is hereditary. You get it from your kids. We, we get all kinds of situations in which we have great deal of stress, but we really haven't learned, most of us haven't learned how to deal with it effectively, how to manage that stress, how to avoid the situation that causes us to raise our blood pressure. By the way, stress causes your arteries to constrict. They, they gave students exams and gave them questions. They gave one group questions that couldn't be answered. And the other group got regular exam questions. And they, read, and they measured their blood pressure and their arterial constriction. And they found out the ones that got the questions they couldn't answer, their arteries constricted. They, con they, they actually got smaller and reduced the flow of blood, which caused the blood pressure to go up. It was like putting your thumb on the end of a hose. If, if you push, if you restrict the flow, it comes out with more pressure. And the blood pre high blood pressure is not good for you over a sustained period of time, as everybody knows. So we have three aspects. The diet, the exercise. By the way, what's the best aerobic exercise? Well, there are a lot of good ones, but the simplest, easiest, and least harmful is walking. Just play walking. And the secret about aerobic exercise is you have to do major muscle groups, you have to move major muscle groups for 15 minutes or longer without stopping. You can't walk through the mall and stop every three or four minutes and admire the things in the store window. Even if you walk for an hour, you're not getting aerobic benefit. You're not getting a lot of aerobic benefit if you play tennis because you're stopping and waiting and starting and stopping and waiting. You're not making the constant raise of your heart level over a constant period of time. Now, Ornish recommends at least 45 minutes of aerobic exercise a day. That's a walk, but you don't have to do it in one shot. You can do 15 minutes in the morning and 15 minutes during lunch and 15 minutes in the evening and still get your 45 minutes. As long as you do it for 15 minutes without stopping, you get the cardiovascular benefit from aerobic exercise. I do walk one hour, four miles before breakfast every morning, seven days a week. And, and if you think about it, some people say, well, I do it three days a week. Well, three days a week is a lot better than none. But seven days a week is better than three or four or five or six. And if you don't want to walk seven days a week, try six days a week. I'll tell you another stress-reducing thing that I learned. I don't know if you've heard of Dr. Andrew Weil, but he's a very interesting wellness physician in Arizona. And I said, what can I do to lower stress? And he says, go on a news fast. What, what's that? What's a news fast? He says, just one day a week, just don't watch the television news. Just don't watch it. Well, I felt so much better not watching it one day a week. I tried it two days a week. I haven't watched a television news program at all in 10 years now. You know, I haven't missed it. I really don't miss it. Well, in fact, occasionally when some major disaster or something, I'll turn on the you know, CNN or something to see. I think, how in the world do people sit there and watch that stuff all day? Some of it's really crazy. But I read the papers, I read magazines, I get information on the web, which is probably 99% false. Uh, I stay informed, but I don't watch television news anymore, and it feels great. There are a lot of other things you can do. The two most effective ways of helping you manage stress are yoga and meditation. And, and Ornish uses both of those in his support groups. He has a yoga master teacher, a physician, teach yoga to his uh, patients and his groups. And he also teaches them meditation. A lot of people say, well, meditation, isn't that kind of, that's kind of flower child, hippie stuff. I don't, you know, want to get that. Fortune magazine surveyed the CEOs of the top 500 corporations and found out that over half of them 
do meditation every day. Over half the CEOs of the five, top 500 corporations. I hope that wasn't Exxon, it was all of them. <laughs> He's kind of mellow, isn't he? But he has a long time to sit there and think about it now. Anyway. Again, if you're, if you're interested in the book, read it online. Get it from Amazon for almost nothing, because you can get a copy of the book from my website, but you have to pay for what I paid for me to what I paid to print it. But if you go to Amazon, I've seen it down there for two dollars and ninety cents on Amazon. You have to pay three dollars po your postage, but still cheaper than I could have printed it. So it's a good deal there. You can read it online. You can get it at, the, at every branch of the library as well. If you're interested in learning more about a support group and getting in it, call Kaiser. It starts the 23rd, two weeks from tonight. Kaiser Pensacola, the Honolulu Clinic, and call their health and wellness office and make a reservation to get in the class. It's absolutely free. And it lasts for 10 weeks. So if you're interested or you know somebody with heart disease or high cholesterol, high blood pressure, diabetes, I'm, I'm not into weight reduction. There, there's too many people who have really serious medical problems. So I don't usually take people who are just there to lose weight because otherwise the people who are there to really reverse heart disease wouldn't be able to get in. And I do what's called a triage. I, I, take, I find out the people with the most serious medical problems and give them priority. And those who have lesser problems get lesser priority. If there's room for everybody, everybody goes. But, but I only take about 25 people. And if you're interested, please tell, your, your, either for yourself or your friends, that if it's a couple, if there are two people, if one person does the cooking or the other person does any kind of support, I want both people there. It's, it's not, no use if, if the one spouse doesn't support the other. This is important because Ornish's success has probably greater than any other program that we have going today. And by the way, let me tell you about what happened to Ornish. Ornish convinced a major insurance company, a Blue Cross Blue Shield insurance insurer in the Middle West, to give it a trial for those people who were scheduled for bypass surgery. Instead, put them through his group for a year. Well, it turned out that None of the people that went to his group had to have the surgery. All of them got better. Nobody died. And the insurance company saved an average of $30,000 in the first year in actual expenses. $30,000 per person. So now there are 17 major insurance carriers who are supporting Ornish's program all over the United States. And he's actually got, it's gotten so big, he had to actually farm it out to the Highmark Corporation, a health services company. The, one of the key important parts of Ornish's program is support, support groups. And his original program was twice a week meetings. Now, in, in many of them, it's only once a week, but it's still weekly. And I found out that people who stop coming to the support groups usually stop being on the program, and when the support groups end, they have a hard time. They need the support. You can get support. You can make your own support group. You can get two or three people together and meet once a week and talk about how things are going, talk about new recipes, talk about how to get certain things done. And it's amazing how networking and support really brings it all together and helps. I started doing this 12 years ago, and I started devising recipes of foods that usually were high fat and make them low fat and change the food the way it was. Sometimes the taste changed, sometimes it tasted exactly the same. And I now have about 250 very low fat vegetarian recipes online on the website at www.kumu.org. So if you want recipes, including long rice and, and island favorites as well as others. You can get Starbucks Frappuccino for six cents a serving if you make it yourself. The recipe's online. Chili's bean, you know, the chili's baked beans, 
from Chili's restaurant or on there, all of these have been modified to make them low fat and make them vegetarian and, and they work. Uh, and right now, there's a school of 200 people, 200 children who live in at the school, it's a residential school outside of Boston who are being served three meals a day, low fat vegetarian and the recipes come from my book. It's kind of wonderful because the kids love the food. They used to do nothing but complain about the food. Now they're saying, and I went and visited them just, to, just uh, two weeks ago and talked with the kids. And they were, oh, I like this and I like that. And can you use some more recipes like this? They were really excited about it. So it doesn't mean that the quality or the taste is any less than the foods that people really enjoy. And some of them are so easy that the directions are one line. You know, most people who work can't play galloping gourmet when they get home. They, they need food to be able to make things that are quick and easy and still taste good and are still nutritious. And so that's the whole idea of it. And you'll find lots of other recipe books, both online and on the Vegetarian Society's website. All the books are available. All, all the books we used to sell, plus more, are available. If you want a scientific discussion of what I've talked about, much more detailed, but very, very easy to read, get a hold of a book called The China Study. If anyone here was here when Dr. Colin Campbell gave his talk last year, it was at the end of last year, I think it was, his book hadn't come out yet then. It's the most absolutely readable, interesting, informative book on the relationship to what you eat and how healthy you are. And he has a very interesting section in the book called The Dark Side of Science. And he talks about how the food industries and the pharmaceutical industries actually influence what scientific reports come out, what you read about and what you don't read about, about in science. And you find out that you're not getting all the information, nor does the government give you this. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but you'll find out that, that big business does affect what the government lets you know. And you'll find out what the real truth is by reading that book. I recommend it very highly. You can get the book on the VHS website. And every time you buy a book on the, the society's website, a very small percentage goes to the society as well. So you're benefiting yourself and VHS at the same time. Does anybody have any questions? I forget the cholesterol. Down to 70. Oh, we don't need to get it down to 70. And it won't hurt you to do it. My cholesterol was 372 when I started 12 years ago. It's 116 now. I was talking about LDL. LDL. Oh, L my total cholesterol was 372. It's 116 now. LDL, it, there, there are a number of different ways of reducing LDL. And some of it has to do with genetics. And some of it has to do with what you do, what, whether you exercise. One of the best ways of lowering LDL is to raise HDL. And raising HDL is lowering fat and doing more exercise. Lowering your fat content, avoiding any kind of animal protein, and exercising. And that raises the HDL. The HDL is what helps take out the LDL. Did you know about the 150 on cholesterol, does everybody here know the magic number is 150? Based on the Framingham study and a number of other studies since, we're talking about 15 to 20 years of study of over 5,000 people. Not one person, at least that I can be aware of, this is Dr. Castelli's study, not one person whose cholesterol was under 150 unmedicated has had a heart attack. So in essence, people who can keep their cholesterol under 150 are about as safe as it's humanly possible to be from heart disease, heart attacks. 
Now that doesn't mean you can't have a valve problem or, or another situation or you can't have congestive heart failure as a result of high blood pressure and things like that, but you won't get blocked arteries as a result of keeping your cholesterol down below 150. And this is a sad commentary because so many doctors will tell you, oh, 200, 200, just keep it under, oh, it's 196, that's wonderful. Why is it then that one third of all the heart attacks take place in people whose cholesterol is between 150 and 200? One out of every three heart attacks happens for somebody whose cholesterol is basically between 150 and 200. That doesn't make sense to tell people that. That's not wonderful. Don't give me a one in three chance of having a heart attack this year. I don't want those odds. I, I want zero chance. So get your cholesterol down to 150 or lower. And the best way to lower your cholesterol is to raise your HDL and then that will help lower your LDL. There are other ways too, but they're really medical questions and I can't answer those. Any other questions? Uh, in the Onish program, the, uh, the, the advocates really low fat, sometimes 10% or less. Could you comment on a number of studies, I think, have come out recently that seem to say higher fat is better overall health wise? Do you have any comment to make on that observation? Well, I can read all kinds of things. I read it in magazines, I read it in journals, I read the wellness thing, but you know, it turns out that the wellness diet really isn't better than a low-fat diet. Their idea of a low-fat diet wasn't a low-fat diet. So I don't know. I know that there are about 25,000 people who are following the Ornish program and keeping 10% or less who are perfectly healthy. Dr. John McDougall says that 10% is all that you need. And Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn of the Cleveland Heart Clinic says that 10% is all his patients need and they stay perfectly healthy. There may be some medical conditions where people need more. I don't know. I, I, I can't speak to that. But I do know that a large enough sample of people of all walks of life who follow the 10% are perfectly healthy. That, that's all I can say about it. What's the difference between a good fat and a bad fat? Fats that come from animals are not good fats. Fats that come from plant foods are much better for you, but still you have to limit the amount of those fats. Like for instance, olives are 80% fat. So if you sit down and eat a pile of olives, you're getting a huge amount of fat. If you, I, I tell people, be very careful. Eat nuts and seeds in moderation. Because what happens is, I see people open a can of mixed nuts and then go sit down by the television and 25 minutes later, you can see the bottom of the can reflecting back. Well, that's too much. You know, an eight ounce thing of, of, of nuts is like eating about seven ounces of fat. We're talking about a huge amount and that's not really good. So, all fat in excess is bad. But plant-based fats are not harmful in, in moderation, but animal-based fats can be harmful even in small amounts because animal-based fats are mostly saturated. They're saturated fats. And you know about like what we call hydrogenated oils. Hydrogenated oils are oils that have been bombarded with hydrogen atoms to make them like saturated fat. Even though they're not saturated, they act in the body just like they're, we call them trans fatty acids. And so when you look at the labels, if you see partially hydrated, but partially hydrogenated, is 90% partially or is 70% of what, you know, what is the partially? As long as it's under 100%, it's partially. So be very careful about foods that have partially hydrogenated. Just look for the word hydrogenated fat. Those are dangerous fats. And they will plug up your arteries and raise your cholesterol and, and also cause other problems 
that you want to try to avoid. So if you say, what's a good fat? People say, oh, well, olive oil is good for you. Well, the whole thing is olive oil in excess is bad for you. Safflower oil in excess is bad for you. All, and any kind of oil, when you have too much of it, is bad for you. So as long as you keep your fat at, for, rever for reversing 10% or for preventing at 20%, then you, you, you get your foods from plant-based sources. You're not, if you don't eat meat, you're not going to get animal-based fat. So, or you don't eat fish and other things, you're not going to get those fat. So I really say, you know, fat is fat is fat, but it, but it, but it, true, you, you should avoid any animal-based fats and animal-based proteins. And by the way, the amount of fat and the amount of cholesterol in a piece of sirloin steak and a piece of boneless, skinless chicken breast is almost the same. You're not really lowering your cholesterol or your fat by changing from beef to chicken. It's not, not a good idea to do that. Let's see, any other questions? Did I answer that? Okay. Flaxseed oil has omegas. It's one of the one of the richest sources of omega, although it has omega three, six, nine, you know, it has has some of the negative omegas as well as the positive omegas. What I read tells me that eating flax seed is a good source of those oils. You know, a tablespoon of flax seed a day sprinkled on cereal or even crushed ground up on ice cream or anything like that. Not, not, not dairy ice cream, but vegetarian ice cream. Uh, you can get that at, at, at Down to Earth and other health food stores. The seed is much more beneficial, not only because it has the oils, but it has the lignans and the fibers that go with it. The oil itself, there's one study, it's controversial, but it shows that there's one study that says that men should avoid flaxseed oil because it has a tendency in some men to accelerate prostate uh, tumor growth. And so where the, they don't seem to have a problem with women about it. The recommendation is if you eat flaxseed, to do it in the seed, not the oil itself. South Beach diet, eggs and cheese. The South Beach diet is, from what I've read, I've never been on it, but from what I've read, it's probably the least of the bad diets. It, it's not a good diet, but it's not, it's not like the Atkins, which is actually a toxic diet, or like some of the others that are bad diets. There are problems. If you can't be in a South Beach diet and be a vegetarian, and you can't be on a South Beach diet and, and maintain a 10% calories from fat, there's no way you can do it. And so if you're trying to reverse or prevent heart disease, the South Beach diet doesn't work. If you're trying to lose weight, the evidence is not very good that you'll keep it off with the South Beach diet. But of, of most of the diets that are around, it's probably one of the least harmful of the not-so-good diets. Okay. okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Neil. That was just great. Uh, Neil's been a longtime Vegetarian Society supporter, and we really always appreciate having him with us. Thank you again for coming. This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and helpful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. vsh.org.